Serial killers can strike in America's largest cities and sometimes escape uncaught. Even though their victims may be murdered within a small area and over a relatively short space of time, it can be difficult for the police to link the killings and then identify one person within a large and shifting population. In one of the most notorious cases, the Boston Strangler's 13 murders, which took place over an 18-month period starting in 1962, the police only solved the case when the murderer, Albert DeSalvo, confessed while in prison for other offenses. The Son of Sam killings, which terrorized New York during 1976 and 77, saw the police receive letters from the killer which made clear his intention to keep striking with increasing frequency. The killings were only ended when a parking violation ticket was traced to David Berkowitz, and he willingly confessed. Other cases remain unsolved. Here are four in which the attacks continued after the police investigation had got underway. Each ended with horrific body counts, but no killer identified. In 1990, New York seemed to be facing another son of Sam, a gunman who attacked random passers-by, causing a wave of terror to sweep over the city. On the 21st of June, 1990, a homeless man sleeping on this bench in Central Park woke to find a man standing over him. Without a word, the man shot him in the body with a .38 pistol and walked off into the park. The victim, 30-year-old Larry Parham, survived and was able to attract passers-by. By him, police found a note, which was signed Zodiac, and seemed to show a knowledge of the victim's astrological sign. The gunman signed off with a symbol which had become familiar with an unsolved series of killings in San Francisco some 20 years earlier, by a killer who also called himself Zodiac. But as Chief of Detectives Joseph Borelli pointed out, it also had a more immediately sinister connection. Uh, the first impression, there was a, uh, a sign on the note that's familiar and uh, very close to the sign that uh, was been displayed before that we have received from the uh, person calling himself the Zodiac. And by uh, comparison now, we're, we're pretty well assured that the individual who has shot three other people is responsible for this fourth shooting. All three had occurred in an eight-block area of Brooklyn and neighboring Queens. The first on the 8th of March, the second 21 days later on the 29th of March, and the third 63 days later on the 31st of May. The police noted the regular cycle of 21 days or multiples thereof. All three victims were still alive when found. In the case of the third shooting, of 78-year-old Joseph Proce, a letter by his body had three astrological signs, his and those of the other two victims. As Chief Borelli now pointed out, all the victims shared certain characteristics. Similarity. There is a similarity. Uh, first gentleman was walking with a cane. Second gentleman, we feel, might have uh, had a few beers. The third individual was walking with a cane. And this gentleman was asleep on a park bench. A week after the first three shootings, letters were sent to the New York Post and the CBS program 60 Minutes from a man who had detailed knowledge of all three shootings. The three signs which he put in the circle were found to be those of his first victims. More sinisterly, Zodiac announced that he intended to fill the circle with victims of the appropriate signs. He also claimed to be the San Francisco Zodiac killer, returned to strike more victims as he had promised over 20 years before. Police doubted this, since the victims were sure that their attacker had been black rather than the white male who had been responsible in San Francisco. From their descriptions, the New York Police Department's artists unit 
was able to create this drawing, which was widely circulated. The artist's unit has a good record of achieving likenesses which have led to many arrests, so hopes were high that there might be a breakthrough. The other major lead which detectives were following up was how the attacker knew the astrological signs of his victims. Chief Borelli emphasized that this was no coincidence. We feel that on one occasion, uh, the person responsible for the shootings approached the victim prior to the shooting and engaged that individual in conversation. And during that conversation, the date of birth was asked of the, of the victim. This got widespread publicity, and soon people were coming forward to report strange conversations. The man was uh, walking in a fairly good clip, stopped abruptly, and uh, said, hey, when's your birthday? And he sounded fairly personable. There was no accent. And uh, I mean, it was just an odd question. I've never had that asked to me before. Others, like talent agent Robert McGowan, were open about his encounter, which had taken place near Central Park. After he asked me about the watch and kind of like stared at me, he said, what sign are you? And you answered? You know, well, I, at first I didn't say anything. And uh, he said, what sign are you? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm Libra. The police now confirmed that a warning note had been sent to the 75th precinct in November 1989, but this had been filed as the work of a crank. Within a few days of the fourth shooting, the search had become a murder hunt when the third victim, Joseph Proce, died in hospital on the 5th of July. Police activity was stepped up and more officers assigned to the task force. The next day, Mayor David Dinkins offered a $10,000 reward. And the killer added to the publicity by writing again to the New York Post, threatening to keep on filling in his astrological chart and repeating his claim to links with the San Francisco Zodiac. Handwriting analysts offered their opinions. He's a very lonely individual since he doesn't relate to people, and with his high libido, it's a total frustration which is built up to a boiling point. So it's just, you know, when your frustration reaches a certain point, something has to give. While professional astrologers cast doubt on whether the Zodiac killer really had a deep knowledge of the subject. I very much doubt that these were planned astrologically, that I'm going to do this at 1.20 in the morning. There are events that astrologers will do that for. I don't think he planned it out. Nevertheless, as the 21st night after the fourth killing approached, there were special patrols on the subway. The press had no hesitation in revealing other steps which were being taken. There was massive publicity throughout the city. The Guardian Angels mounted special patrols in Central Park and other neighborhoods. Whether it was this activity which put the killer off can only be guessed at. But more than five years later, there had been no further Zodiac killings in New York. The case which had obviously influenced the New York killer had started in San Francisco more than 20 years before. At Christmas 1968, in a parking spot near Lake Herman in the Vallejo Hills above the city, a young couple was found shot. Teenager Betty Lou Jensen was sprawled dead near the car. Her boyfriend, David Faraday, had been shot in the head and died before regaining consciousness. Nothing had been stolen, and the police were baffled. Six months later, and only two miles from where Jensen and Faraday had been killed, came another shooting. Mike Magot was still alive, but his girlfriend, Darlene Ferrin, was slumped dead in the car. When he recovered sufficiently, Magot described her killer as white, round-faced, with wavy brown hair. A month later, on the 1st of August, three local newspapers received letters. These gave details of the ammunition used and the position and wounds of the victims, which had never been released officially. 
Each letter also had a third sheet with a message in cipher, with each editor only receiving one third of the message. The writer asked that the whole message should be printed on the front page of each newspaper. He warned that if this were not done, he would go on a murder spree, killing lone people in the night. The letters were signed with a symbol similar to a gun sight. The message was published as requested. It proved difficult to crack until a school teacher, Dale Hayden, had the idea of searching for symbols which might make up the word kill. This proved the key, and the rest of the message soon followed. It began, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. And the writer went on to say that he had already killed five people in the San Francisco Bay Area. Shortly afterwards, another letter was received in which the writer referred to himself as Zodiac. This was the name seized on by the press. Two months later, on the 27th of September, 1969, another young couple was attacked in this picnic area beside Lake Berryessa. 20-year-old Brian Hartnell and his girlfriend were tied up and repeatedly stabbed. 22-year-old Cecilia Shepard died two days later, but Hartnell made a slow recovery. Although he had used a knife, not a gun this time, the killer left a message scrawled on the side of the couple's car. This made it clear that the Zodiac had struck again. Only two weeks later, on the 11th of October, a taxi driver was seen slumped in his cab, being searched by a stocky white man. When police arrived, they found that Paul Stein had been shot dead. Witnesses enabled the police to draw up this portrait, which was widely circulated. But any doubts about the killer's identity were dispelled the next day, when a letter from Zodiac arrived at the San Francisco Chronicle. With it was a blood-stained piece of the driver's shirt and a bullet from the same pistol that had killed Jensen and Faraday. The letter also chillingly ended School children make nice targets. I think I will wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the tires and then pick off the kiddies as they come tumbling out. But mercifully, despite this threat, the murder of Paul Stein was a San Francisco Zodiac's last known killing. The police continued to receive letters and what purported to be evidence of other killings. The case remained open, and even many years later, officers still felt it essential to take almost every contact seriously, although none was ever authenticated. Dear editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. I am back with you. Tell Herb Kane I am here. I have always been here. That city pig Toski is good, but I am smarter and better. For Detective David Tasky, this taunting letter was only one of many leads which had needed to be followed up. For although senior officers believed that the San Francisco Zodiac killer must either have died or moved away, they knew that they could not afford to take any chances. Psychiatrists studying serial killers believed that it would be unlikely that he would have stopped voluntarily. Once serial killers get hooked on murder, their need for the thrill seems to get greater and more uncontrollable the more they kill. The San Francisco Zodiac killings remain an open case. Ironically, probably the biggest series of unsolved killings by a single murderer took place in one of the United States' safest cities, Seattle. On the 12th of August, 1982, a woman's body was found in the Green River. It was badly decomposed, but the police were able to take fingerprints from it. These identified the body as that of Deborah Bonner, a 23-year-old stripper who had a string of convictions for prostitution. The body of another prostitute, 16-year-old Wendy Coffield, had been found strangled in the river about a month earlier. And over the next three days, searchers found three more bodies. Marcia Chapman, who had been missing since the 1st of August. Cynthia Hines, who had last been seen on the 11th. And Opal Mills, who had disappeared on the 12th, 
just when Deborah Bonney's body was being pulled from a different part of the river. Now the police realized that they were dealing with a serial killer who was striking with dreadful regularity. All the girls had been regulars on the notorious strip, Pacific Highway South, running from Seattle to SeaTac Airport. A massive operation began, with prostitutes and their pimps and customers being questioned. But tragically, the police's best hope of catching the killer had already gone. Knowing that serial killers often like to return to gloat over their victims' bodies, the police had set up a covert surveillance of the Green River. This was blown within days, when a local TV station naively revealed that the river was being watched. By the end of the year, 16 girls had been murdered, all apparently by the Green River Killer. By April 1983, despite growing pressure on the police, another eight girls had disappeared, and they seemed no nearer solving the case. By the end of 1983, the number of killings attributed to the Green River Killer had reached 40. At that time, by far the largest number ever perpetrated by a single serial killer in the United States. Police efforts were now galvanized by a devastating report into their progress, which showed that although they had put in thousands of man hours and collected masses of information, this was hopelessly disorganized, with no attempt being made to collate it and look for leads and links. The report had been prepared by Bob Keppel, a special investigator in the Washington State Attorney's Office. Keppel had played a major role in tracking down Ted Bundy, who had killed at least 23 girls in more than five states, starting in Washington and ending in Florida. He had learned the hard way the importance of collating and organizing information when tracking down a serial killer. As a result of the report and renewed public disquiet at the sheer volume of girls disappearing from the Strip, a new Green River Task Force was established in January 1984 under Captain Frank Adamson, with Bob Keppel as its chief consultant. Again, plainclothes officers flooded the strip and mixed with the prostitutes and their customers. Thousands of new statements were taken and potential suspects investigated. New computer systems were introduced, and special efforts were made to control and sift all new evidence and integrate the mass which had already been collected. For officers such as Bob Evans, it seemed that only one more thing was needed. One lucky break. One individual out there that knows in their heart who's done this and has been reluctant to come forward. This suspect, this individual, has had a remarkable string of luck, and sooner or later, uh, it's going to run out. During 1984, girls continued to disappear, and more bodies were found. The police continued to come up with new suspects, but always the suspect seemed to be able to produce an alibi, and detectives learned to be publicly cautious. We're saying that this is a man that we felt we had to look at at this particular time. We developed a lot of information on, and we're going forward and taking a look at him. As far as viable suspect, I think it's synonymous with person of interest, someone that we are interested in following up on. But as far as saying this is the person that did the Green River killing, it certainly doesn't mean that at all. But by the spring of 1984, the number of bodies being found and girls disappearing had begun to tail off. 17-year-old topless dancer Cindy Ann Smith, who disappeared from the strip on the 21st of March, 1984, was the 45th and last that the police would definitely attribute to the Green River Killer. Bodies continued to be found as when some boys were collecting cans in a deserted canyon in 1987. Well, I went down the hill, I picked up a few cans and walked about 20 feet up the canyon a little and seen, discovered the bones. Just lying there out in the yeah, open? Just lying too too like they're like leg bones, two long leg bones. I picked one up, you know, just just to see if it was a bone, it was, and I set it back down, picked up a stick, started, you know, moving in the area of the plywood where the body would, you know, there you know, bones all underneath the plywood, all scattered up, you know, above the skull. And I must have triggered something because the skull felt, you know, come rolling down and 
the nice one, I just kind of sat there for a minute and started screaming for my friend. But by then, the police had cautiously concluded that the Green River killer must have died or moved away. The Green River Task Force was finally stood down in January 1990. Detectives had interviewed more than 15,000 suspects, but they were no further forward than the day seven and a half years before when a careless television broadcast destroyed their best hope of catching the killer. Had they done so, then at least 40 girls might have been saved, and what is probably America's biggest series of unsolved killings need never have happened. For the story did not end in Seattle. A few years later, in San Diego, police were faced with a series of killings which bore chilling similarities to the Green River killings further north. Once again, it was prostitutes being taken from the city's notorious El Cajon Boulevard. They were raped and their bodies dumped on waste ground around the city. By the end of the 1980s, more than 25 bodies had been discovered. Not only were the parallels with the Green River killings disturbing, but the trade of the victims and the secrecy of their clients presented the police with similar problems in tracking down their quarry, as this spokesman made clear. Their lifestyle, their personalities, the people they associate with are into illegal activities or on the fringe of illegal activities. That is frustrated to some extent our attempt, if you will, to get information. If these victims were a middle class, housewife, the suburban neighbor, if you will, it would be a wholly different type of case. The police never admitted any connection between the San Diego and Green River killings, but for journalists Tom Gian and Carlton Smith, there were no doubts. It's hard to imagine how a, two killers working independently can make them look the same. There's just too much there. The San Diego murderer has still not been caught. Detectives have to face the possibility that one of the United States' biggest serial killers is still on the loose, having simply moved down the West Coast to continue his murderous rampage. Like Detective Dan Nolan of the Green River Task Force, they can only hope he makes a mistake. I think it's been the, uh, the history of serial killers that ultimately they slip up. Uh, if we look at Wayne Williams, we look at John Gacy, uh, and several other serial killers, we find that somewhere, as they became more and more comfortable and more and more confident in what they were doing, that they became less careful in what they were doing. And I think he's lucky more than he's clever. But luck or skill have kept the San Diego, Green River, and Zodiac killers free. Their stories emphasize the difficulties that modern police forces face in trying to track down murderers whose best defense is their apparent ordinariness, their ability to blend into the population of America's great cities. I think the FBI right now, the Behavioral Sciences Unit, indicates that there are between 20 and 30 serial murderers operating in the United States at any given moment. Uh, I think that their ability to operate successfully uh, is very much based on the fact that they do fit in the community so well, that they are the person next door. They're the, the clerk at the convenience store, the clerk at the fast food store, the clerk in the bank, or whatever they might be, the, the policeman in the community. They can be any of those people. He could be right next door to anyone USA. 